Coming to you straight from the Rio Grande and beyond. And beyond. Broadcasting to the four corners of the globe. So grab your seat, your coffee, or your sundowner. Okay, everybody, here we go. On point, as always. This is Gloves Off. Gloves Off. I'm back at you with gloves off and today I have a great guest my brother from from another mother and we're going to be touching base on training pray mantis kung fu jowls a little bit of everything that is meant for bettering the body I'm here with uh, Dr. Dale Douglas how are we doing my brother you doing good doing great my friend you know it's it's a little rainy here in Florida but you know no complaints no complaints where are you in Florida are you at I'm in Port Ritchie. I'm about, you know, almost an hour, like, northwest of Tampa. I used to live in Tampa. I got divorced, moved out here. I was working for a, another acupuncturist. We had a clinic out here, but unfortunately, with all the COVID and everything, we had to shut down. So I'm, I'm basically back to working by myself. So I'm, I'm close to Tampa, and I work everywhere in Tampa Bay. I do acupuncture home visits now. So I don't have a clinic. I come to you. So anybody listening who's in the Tampa Bay area, don't worry. You don't have to come to me and wait on me. I will come to you and wait on you. But so that's, that's me. That's what, me here in Florida. That's the way it should be. But, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, of course, uh, Chinese medicine has always been associated with the Chinese arts. A lot of seafoods did it. A lot of seafoods practiced it. Uh, everybody kind of that was in Kung Fu that was serious practitioner kind of dabbled in it. Right. A lot of people didn't know what they were doing, but they dabbled. Like, like I say, the word dabble. So today I want to I want to touch base on on uh, your praying mantis stylist. Let's touch base on that. And then that kind of, let's just move forward. How'd you get involved with praying mantis? It's interesting. You know, you, people say praying mantis. And of course, here in the United States, when you say the word praying mantis, you either think of the Walloon system first and foremost, you know, Sigu Champoy. Uh, and then other people think of the seven star or, you know, uh, the, the seven star mantis that's very common. When I say common, I mean common that you saw, not that, you know, the material, like Sifu Brendan Lai, he was a seven-star mantis Sifu, and he was incredible. What I do is a little different. It's what we call Hakka mantis. You hear the word South mantis put in front of it. But most of us now, we've kind of, we more of us are saying Hakka. We want to differentiate it from, you know, the more the more common styles. You see, Hakka systems are very, they're, they're usually not very public, you know, so you're talking white eyebrow, southern mantis, southern dragon, the, the dragon shadow system. These systems were all created in a certain area and were created by the Hakka people who were being persecuted and basically being driven. They were from the Northwest. They were driven to the Southwest and then all around the world, they were persecuted. And so they created martial arts that were very um, simple in appearance. So they have few forms, but a lot of conditioning drills. And so when you hear the words South Manus or White Eyebrow or Southern Dragon, if you hear the word Hakka, most people associate a serious conditioning program you see in both of the you know in all of these systems and so conditioning first and foremost what are you going to start with well you're going to start with your footwork you're going to start with your what we call a stance and in mantis it's funny because we don't hold our hands closed a lot we learn actually to kind of open ourselves up and invite people in so it's a little different most you know most people have got their hands closed or you see the you know you see the you know the, the mantis people with the gal the hook Instead, in Southern Mantis, we don't use a hook, really. We use a pointy little thing called a fungi, a fungi can. So how do you train this? How do you condition this? Well, we'll get into that. But first and foremost, think about your body from your head to your toe. You need to learn how to stand. You know, how do we stand? Well, in Mantis, we have a toe to heel. You know, we don't have a really wide stance. It's pretty much based on you. It's not based on your teacher. It's based on your structure. So... A good martial art, you shouldn't copy your teacher. What you should do is you should take the material your teacher gives you and fit it into your body. Now, I'm a big, tall, big kind of guy. I'm not a little monkey looking person. So I'm not going to run up somebody's leg and do a monkey technique very good because I try to run up your leg, your leg's going to just, you know, flat. I'm too big. Right. You know? But for, for the mantis material, I'm not going to try to run up to you, but I'm going to try to, you know, cut your power very quickly and own the situation. So most of the Hakka systems are known for very fast hands with a lot of conditioning. So we do a lot of drills with the arms. And the first one we would usually do with a, with a partner 
is what we call three star. You'd be standing in front of another person, you know, you're throwing your arm down, you're throwing your arm up, and then you're throwing your arm down again. And you're basically trying to train all the, supposed they say an edge, we don't call it, we call it a bridge. So you've got your upper bridge, your lower bridge, your inside bridge, and your outside bridge. In other words, however I put my hand against you, it all depends on where I am, you know, the nomenclature. Okay. Now, how do you train your bridge? Well, we're, you know, it's not just banging. We also do uh, training where we put sticks on top of our arms and we have a partner put their arm on the top of the sticks and you actually push against each other. And that causes the rattan stick to scrape up and down your arm and condition your tissue, your muscles, you know, and the bones eventually. That bone, bone conditioning takes a long time. Why? Well, we really have to get to the nitty gritty of this stuff. There's two concepts we have to understand in science. It's called Wolf's Law and Davis's Law. When we put stress on our body, on the tissues and on the bones, over time, they're going to get stronger, denser. They're going to be much more healthy. They're going to have a lot more uh, blood flow and circulation. So over time, putting stress on your body is going to make you bigger, stronger, and you're going to work better. So it's the same whenever we think of a conditioning routine. We have to think of it as a progressive training where you're putting stress on your system, you know, whether it be your hands, whether it be your arms, whether it be your body, you know. Though I wouldn't tell anybody to bang their head to try to condition the iron head like you see in some of these silly kung fu movies. No, you're going to develop, you know, neurological issues, Parkinson's, MS. Don't, don't bang your head against trees and, you know, it, Years ago, there was a master teaching the iron head on, a, on an iron pump bag, and he was head butting the bag. Um, that teacher actually wound up stroking out years later. You wonder why? Well, you know, again, hitting your head over time, it, again. Of course. You know, you've heard these stories, you know, where, oh, we got to do this 6,000 times, 10,000 reps, and you're like, well, maybe over time, not in one session. <laughs> You know, but you hear these people that say, oh, if one is good, 10,000 is better. I'm like, well, I'd rather have quality over quantity any day. Right. So, I mean, think about, you know, Mantis. Mantis is hitting. Hitting us, hitting the partner. It's pretty primitive. But then what happens after you hit somebody? Well, you've got bruising. You've got, you know, you've got, you know, irritated skin. You know, it, it's stinging. Uh, you know, either stinging, itching, or inflamed. What do we use? Well... For years, you probably have seen your teacher pull out a really like a small bottle or something, you know, container where he put liquid out and then put the liquid on you. Well, the liquid here we're talking about is Dita gel or Tetaju or, you know, any kind of, you want to call it. My teacher called it hand medicine because, you know, they used it more for the iron palm. And so they called it hand medicine. They had a specific formula for the hand. Then we have other formulas, you know, for other purposes. So not all formulas do all the same thing. So. I always tell my students, you know, get yourself a good liniment. Now, of course, I'm a little biased because I've been doing, I've been making my own herbs for years, but I don't ever disparage against other people. I'm like, say, it doesn't matter. What's important is, does the liniment do what it's supposed to do? Is it protecting you? Is it helping you recover? Is it helping you get better in your, whatever you're training in? You know, what, what's the material? You know, it doesn't have to be martial arts. I mean, you can use any of our, you know, medicines in any sport. It's just like we were saying, the Chinese systems and the Southeast Asian systems seem to have a medicinal component that has been lost over time. You know, many people, many of the teachers were what we call like barefoot doctors. They were, you know, they were acupuncturists, they were herbalists. Remember, you didn't go to school to learn this. You actually apprenticed under somebody for many, many years. And then eventually they said, okay, it's, it's time for you to go open your clinic. Like Wong Fei Hong. Wong Fei Hong was very famous for having a, you know, he had a medical clinic, not just the Kung Fu thing. I think he actually was more famous for the, the medicine than the Kung Fu in the beginning. And of course, later on, you know, you know, here in the, here in this, in this country, we don't see it much anymore. We have a few people like myself, you know, Tom Bizio in New York, you know, there's a few other instructors who, you know, we've been exposed to all the medicinal sides as well as all the martial sides. You know, and it's good. Why? Because if somebody gets hurt in class, you're going to have less issue, you know, using my, you know, using medicines in class is going to reduce your liability. So that's a whole nother topic to talk about is how to make sure you're not harming yourself and your students. 
first and foremost, yeah, use your job because most people, they put it on and they go, where'd the pain go? And I'm like, it went somewhere else. Well, what's in that? I go, eh, it's just a bunch of plants, roots, leaves. You know, sometimes I put a snake in there, you know, and we use you know, it. And, and you're absolutely correct because liniments have been around for the longest time. And in the West, it kind of got lost a lot faster than in, in the East. And understand the arts of the East. They kind of, now you start seeing them kind of dilute away. Right. But 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they were still very much pre pre prevalent, right, in some of the schools. It's or they funny. knew about it. But if you look at the West, they, they lost their senses probably in the 60s, 50s. Right. Uh, some of the old boxers used to use that. Thing. You know, you, you talk about uh, Jack Dempsey and how his, he used to condition his hands, you know. Oh, yeah. Horse, horse urine was one of the main things that he would use. Fermented horse urine was one of the things that helped him toughen his hands when he was there. But not only the acid, he, all that urea, all that sodium, the salts. I mean, you got to remember, urine is full of all these different kinds of salts that we don't need and we get rid of. Salt actually thickens your dermis. So if you soak your hands in some kind of salt water, he just knew, he knew the minerals that are coming out of that. Why? It's calcium. It's the things that, you again, excess minerals you get rid of. All those minerals you need for healthy bones, for injuries. It's not just for toughening. The stuff that's in, you know, all those, all those minerals are actually good for recovery, healing, and, and strength. And he, he knew something. I wonder if he learned it from an old trainer that, you know, just passed it down. Oh, somebody well, figured it out. It along. Cause you, you, you hear, he's talked about it. Some of the old boxers, you had Marciano work with it. Uh, you had uh, Willie Pep, all those guys work with them back then. And you, you're like, when did it leave? When did it stop? And when did they stop passing it down? Like I said, probably around the 60s, 50s, 60s. Right. Is when you started, started, you know, you don't hear all that anymore. You know, of course, Dempsey was back in the 20s and, and you hear some of that stuff in Savat the same way, but you don't see it anymore. I, you know, Rocky Marciano was a local to me. He was from Brockton, Mass. So again, you know, I met people, you know, he was really, really old when I was a kid. So, you know, never got to meet him personally, but saw people, talk to people he trained with. And they were always, they said, oh yeah, he used to soak his hands when he was younger. Because he had a huge heavy bag. Dude, this thing was like 300 pounds. Kind of like Bruce Lee with his huge heavy bag. And he used to beat the snot out of it and then soak his hands. And I'm like, funny, like iron pump training. They're hitting their hands and then they're doing something after the training to recover and to get stronger. And I'm like, so in looking back, I'm like, dude, they had iron pump. Or what, you don't have to well, say well, pump. Equi equivalent for it. You know, I would say iron fist because I do teach iron fist training where, you know, like my karate friends or anybody wants to knuckle people, you know, not palm them all the time. I'm like, OK, little smaller bag. You know, we're going to put it lower. You know, we're going to relax and just kind of get this whipping kind of like a wrecking ball kind of effect, you know, because I'm not I'm not into this stuff anymore. That's great when I was a kid learning, you know, linear. But now it's more I don't pull my hands back and I'm whipping around usually like a and, you know, the arm is this soft kind of connection cord and then the hand is this wrecking ball that you know you're throwing it at the target you know or you're throwing your again it doesn't matter what shape my hand is i'm throwing this thing out with a very light you know you can't you can't be fast if you're if you're tense if you're tight. absolutely you cannot so you know, these exercises people, you know people I think all, I learned from, what, by training and my trainer richard right? sheila i'm going to give credit to him he says you know quit being tight and, and he sat me down and he goes why and it goes very simple. The, the tighter you are, the more oxygen your body's taking, and you're creating more lactic acid. And I said to myself, ah, okay. So right. all the guys in Savat are very relaxed. I've always been impressed with Savat. You know, why? The smooth and the speed that they – and you see them practice, and they're not going crazy. I've seen – you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, they do the yeah. drills like any other. You get – but in the beginning, I'm like, dude, smooth is fast, fast is smooth. Okay. That's a secret. There we go. That's good. Plus, you guys train stick. A lot of people don't know, but you guys train the cane. And I think the cane helps develop a much more circular method. That's why I train in, 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 in not only Indonesian, but Filipino martial arts privately. Why? Dude, those circles and movements I need to learn. Absolutely. I, I, I'm not a Kempo guy, but I've, I've got friends who studied, you know, for years with, you know, uh, Tony Cogliandro in New England, very, very well-known 
And I've met, I've met Grandmaster Parker years ago at a seminar, and I was amazed that this man was the big, how big he was and how smooth and fast he was. And I heard that he used to buy Ditta Jiao from Lao Bun. Lao Bun was a, was a Chorley foot sifu in, you know, L.A. And that, you know, Mr. Parker, he was like, wait a minute, he had the best Jiao. So he actually, I, you know, and people go, why? And I go, because, you know, Mr. Parker, he seriously conditioned his hands and he knew he needed the best medicine. So he was buying it from Lao Bun. And it's funny because the, the Lao Bun people are like, yeah, we, we sell all the Jiao to the karate guys so they don't kill themselves. You know, it's like, okay, great. You know, I'm known. And, and what, what, what you're saying there, cross-training, a lot of folks say, no, nobody cross-trained. That instructor didn't cross-train. That instructor didn't cross-train. Really? Really? They didn't cross-train? People have been cross-training left and right. Some of them cross-trained for themselves. They'll leave the system alone, but they themselves cross-train. I need, okay. I train with a few different people, and one of these, one of these men, he's a very well-known Info, info, you know, information marketer. He's very, you know, he's very famous for that. And we were talking, and we've become good friends. And he said, you know, you need to, you need to keep learning from people who are at a higher level than you. Now, I got to a point in my training where I've been training for over forty years. You know, I, I, I got, I need something brand new, something I've never studied before, something that's going to help me not only be neurogenic, but it's going to bring my, you know, everything up another notch, another level. And people look at me, I go like, they said, what do you mean? I go look. If you've been training for so long, you, you, you know when you hit a, like a plateau. You can do everything you want, you, and you're noticing it. You're like, this is great, but you, you're kind of stalled. You're like, wait a minute, I can't. I'm trying to do something that just for a reason. You know what? I went looking for people. Why? I need, to, I need to train with a certain person. Why? They've been doing this for almost 70, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. I need to go see them. Why? I need that kind of, I need that kind of mentor to help me. So I'm training with three, you know, I'm training with Roger Haygood and Mantis. I train with Mark Wiley in Integrated Escrima through Russ Smith. And I'm also yeah. training in C-Lot under William Sanders. Why? Because these things, these teachers have been doing it for so long. I, I sought out that person. I needed, I needed their help. You know, I don't know sticks. I need, st I need to learn sticks and blades. Why? Because that's probably pretty much the most fundamental weapon you're going to come across is a stick or a knife. Not everybody has guns, but everybody can pick up a stick or a knife and try to hurt you. So I'm like, okay, that's a good, you know, so the Filipino, yes. People go, well, why the heck are you learning to see a lot? I go, the power generation. And people, what do you mean? I go, dude, the way, the way Guru Sanders moves and how he generates whole body power is amazing. He's a little person. No, he's a good, he's a good friend of mine and uh, one that I consider a brother and uh, he's a good friend and uh, we talk a lot and we, you know, and, uh, and it's exactly right. And again, some people say, again, they say, why? And I go, look, don't I, the question is not why the question is what do they have to offer you? And if you find something that they, they, you know, you want, then you have to ask yourself the three questions. Now I got the three questions from Dr. John Painter. I used to I used to train under Dr. Painter. I was one of his instructors in his association. I'm no longer with him, but I always give him, you know, I always tell people, hey, I train with this person. I talk to that person. You know, if you're interested, go, go seek them out. Why? You know, I had a falling out with the association that had nothing to do with anything because I had, I went back to school to become an acupuncturist and had to open up a clinic. So I couldn't teach at my school. So I gave my school to my senior student and I left the association. Anyway, Dr. Painter taught me the three questions. The three questions are, what is it? What's the material? Second question, what is it for? And the third question is, how do you train it? If you can't answer one or all three of those questions, you're wasting your time. It's not martial arts. It's something else. Mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't matter what it is. Any skill you want to train, what's the skill? You know, what's, the, what's the concept? What's the material? And how the heck do I figure it out and work it? You know? And a lot of people, that third one, how do, you know, how do I work it? You know, how do you apply it? That's a problem. I have friends that know form after form after form after form. And I said, well, what's that for? And they go, I don't know. I just had to learn this for, you know, for a piece of paper. Sure. And I'm like, what the heck is that for then? I, he, you know, like all the forms in Mantis or how we apply them are the same. Very little has changed. You know, and that's why I've always like, you know, Kempo from a self-defense standpoint is because people teach you, hey, look, it's something I can do this, 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 and this, or I can do that, 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 that. But they teach you basic ways of the first thing they teach you is, wait a minute, something's coming. I have to engage. I've got to, I've got to, you know, you got to do something because somebody's throwing a punch or a kick or a grab at you, or they're, they're coming at you, you know, with something in their hand. 
you know, you can't just stand there, you're going to get harmed. So, you know, first and foremost is how do you make that first movement of, wait a minute. How do you act? How do you act when you, when you react? That's what right. I tell people. So, yep. you know, what's coming at you, you know, this and the other thing. So it's funny how a lot of people that, that, that application kind of definition kind of goes out the window. You and know? you have to realize, you, you know, you have to realize a lot of this. Um, and I tell this with, with a lot of, a lot of folks in martial arts, I tell them, you have to realize for what the martial art was developed for. And if once you realize for what that martial art was developed for and right. why it is being practiced, then you'll appreciate it. But if you go into a martial art and they claim that you're going to stop every knife and gun and all this other stuff, ain't gonna, it's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah um, Good luck. It's not there. Fine. My, you know, my, and, and you also have to realize that night, I tell folks in there, I go, just like there are uh, fake religious guys, there's fake martial artists. Oh, yeah. And there's plenty of them. And they go, how can you dilute it? Well, you can see the red flags a mile away if you've been around for a while. If, yeah. you're, a brand, if, you, if, if you're a brand new person, you, you're going to get skunked. You might be shammed real quick. And people say, yeah, how yeah, do we, we talk about the eyes, right? Yeah. Right, you know, and, uh, and, and folks say, how can you tell? Well, it just depends. You know, the, ki- the guy's 24 years old and he's calling himself a grandmaster or a master. That's one of the things. I'm 16. I founded, I founded my, my first real martial art at 16. I'm like, yeah, okay. You, you created something that you thought was yours, but dude, what the hell do you know at 16? You don't even know how to wipe your ass properly at 16. Yeah. You know, I didn't you know, know anything. I didn't know anything at 16, even though I've been training since I was, you know, I was 11 when I started, you know, I was six foot two as a kid. So they kind of, you know, I got trained, you know, and I, tr- dude, my first martial art was a Weichi Ru Karate Dojo a mile from my house. And I was in that school every freaking day getting the snot beat out of me. Why? Because that's what we did. We did a lot of conditioning and we did a lot of, you know, drills. We didn't work just on the forms. We took the forms and, you know, what we call bunkai in Japanese. Bunkai means the application of what you're learning. Sure. So that word application. Hey, we use it in medicine too. So to come back to it, it's not just the training and the rep application of your material. If you're seriously training, what's the edge? What makes, what makes some of these combat athletes, you know, better than the average person? They've got a secret weapon that you don't know about. You know, your, your seafood. I remember my seafood coming, coming in the next day. We used to do a lot of conditioning and the next day he came in and he was like, Hey, how you doing? And we're all bruised and, you know, ah, sore. Cause he was teaching us something. He was trying to teach us something. And then he gave us bottles of Ditta Chow. We put it on. And then the next day we came in, hey, and that's now we know why. Oh, we need to do this every time after we train. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't understand that. And, and we can go into conditioning as well. There's a lot of folks that all of a sudden they want, they've, everybody's heard about iron fist, iron palm, iron shirt, and so on and so forth. But how many people are doing it correctly? And how many people are out there hurting themselves? while they think they're doing it correctly. That's There's the question. Lot, you know, uh, we, you, you and I both, we, we've seen this, brother, and it's not just Chinese people. You've got people, and, you know, you've got the whole Okinawan Japanese, you know, karate scene where people are banging on makiwara. Now, my suggestion is you best be not banging on something that's solid. Like I see people punching rocks and, you know, banging on sides of houses. And I'm like, what are you doing? That's a little, now tapping, if you're tapping one thing, but these people are full blown smashing with full power. And I'm like, eventually something's going to go. And I don't think it's going to be the house. I think it's going to be somewhere in your body. You're going to have, yep. you know, you're going to get a structural damage. And it's not just wrist. A lot of times it's elbow or shoulder, or it's scapular because the force is coming all the way back and it gets stuck up in your scapula. And me being a healthcare provider, I've had hundreds of people come in going, I can't move my scapula. For, and, it, and it's not, they're not all martial art people. It's just, they, They've done something to the point where they, they have, you know, you can't move something. If, you're, if your shoulder blade doesn't move, so we, un, we unstick it, and they're like, oh, my God. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that, you know, no, 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 no. We, we want fluid. We want fluid motion. We don't want impingement, any muscle impingements. You know, so it's people like say, a, It's like the heavy bag. When huh? you get a heavy bag, the heavy bag is doing what? It's moving. So when you hit it, it moves, right? And you hit it again, and it moves. A good, a good post, a makiwara post has some it's gives moving. you. It's not solid. Now the one, okay, the only, the only wall mounted one. I'll, I'll 
I always tell people, Charedo makes a wall-mounted Maki board. It's got a huge, dense foam pad. Then it's got a slotted piece of wood and a leather cover. So you've got this huge, dense. So when you hit this thing, you're not hitting a solid. It's got some give to it. That's the only thing you're going to, you know, if you're going to do something on the wall, make sure make it's got some give. cushioning. It's got yep. some give, so you're not going to, you know, I'm in my 50s, and I have no, I break coconuts, I break people, okay, um, and everybody says, oh, you're going to have hand problems, uh, I'm, I'll be 55 next year, don't have any, nothing yet, you know, but again, I don't condition myself, you know, irresponsibly, it's like weightlifting, you know, you need to train Absolutely. it, but you also need to, you also need to recover. You know, and I'm 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 not talking bad about CrossFit or anything like that because I think they're oh, excellent, no. some excellent athletes there. But you also get a lot of people that go into CrossFit and get hurt. Why? Too much. Because they think they're too no. much. They're doing it without actual too training. Fast. They're too fast and jerking, and guess what happens? They get something, hurt. They get structurally hurt. Something in that kinetic chain is gonna snap, yeah. rip, tear. You know, you, you you get an injury of some kind, whether it's joint, muscle tissue. You know, or a combination of all, or, you know, it could be muscle tissue, tendons. And I mean, dude, some people rip things right off. Had a, had a patient come in, she had ripped off her shoulder muscles doing these pull-up flies. And she was like on her 301st, she was going to do 500. She's on her 301st and the shoulder just said, no, no, we're going to, we're, we're going to take all those muscles and come off the joint. Sure. Cause she was high, you know, she was doing this ballistic exercise and her body went, no, we're done with this, you know? Mm -hmm. And they get upset yeah, that, with their bodies. Don't understand. And, and you have some athletes that have conditioned themselves for that. But the but average that, Joe, they, but the average Joe, but the average Joe has not. These athletes have done this over a period of time, probably years, years mm -hmm. minimum. At least you're talking three to maybe five to ten years. That if you're if you're a serious like competitive athlete. You like have a master's or a PhD in what you do. You've been doing it for a long time. These people have only done it for this long and they're doing it too fast, too quick thinking. I can cheat the system. You ain't cheating nothing. What, what you're cheating on is your recovery and your, and your optimal you know, health. You're, you're paying for it out of that health wallet. You know, you know I, 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 tell, I tell folks this. You can go train. People, there, there's a lot of folks that are going to teach you how to fight. There's a lot of yeah. they're going to tell you how to fight not teach you, tell you how to fight. There's a lot of folks that are going to tell you to throw a punch and tell you how to throw a kick. And they're going to say, do it faster. You're doing great. But technically, if you miss somebody, oh. that other leg, that other leg's going to be, your knee's going to be torn right off. Just enough force. Right. Like you, see it, you start seeing it with these kickbox classes that they have. Yeah. There's no, there's no fundamentals. There's not even no basics. They just tell them, Right kick, left kick, let's kick, go faster, and all of a sudden, my hip hurts or my shoulder hurts. Well, you got a yeah. rotator cuff injury because you were, you were, you know, you were throwing it wrong and hitting. You know, hit, it's always the hitting. It's usually you don't do it shadow boxing unless you're being a total fool. It's usually when you're hitting either the bag or you're working with somebody, and you're just trying to show off and you just do it too fast, too much, or you do too many reps. Why, why is it that we have in our country this idea that if two or 20 is good, then 100 or 1,000 are going to be better? No. It, it, again, quality over quantity. You know, and you look at, you look at the power lifters. Let's, let's just take power lifters. Good example. They'll start, they'll start off with um, 10. Let's start off with 12 reps right. at 100. Yeah. Then they'll do 150 at 10. I'm just putting out numbers. Yeah. Then they're going to do two, two something or 250 at, uh, at uh, eight. Yeah. Then they're going to raise it 275 at six. It's an inverse, they're right? It down. Then by the time they get to 300, they're doing it once or twice. I'm just throwing out these numbers. No, but that's, so it's, a one good, it's a very and common that's training. It's how they do it. And, but if you're going to go into the gym, and your first rep, you're going to be picking up 300 just to show off and doing it. Now I'm going to do 15. I'm going to do 20. Something's going to give, and it's going to give real quick. You know, or people they they're they're just too exuberant. They're just yeah, they're they're okay. They're they're excited. You know, they do something too much, and the next day they wake up and they're like, I'm crippled, and they they quit. It's probably the number one reason people quit anything physical is that they overdo it, 
-hmm. And then they don't realize, oh my God, this is going to happen every time I do this. Well, a little bit, but within reason, you, you, you did a little bit too much. Absolutely. No. So I'm always thinking, it's like a bank account. I want to put a little in my savings account. I want to put a little energy and reserve always in that bank account. If you train to failure, I, I, I don't agree with people that do this. When you train to failure, you're reinforcing and you're telling your body that, you know, that this is what you want. I don't want that. I want optimal, not minimal. I want more skills, more power. I want everything at my, at my fingertips if I need it, when needed, whatever it is. I don't want something that's going to be, I'm tired. I don't, uh, no, dude, you're screwed. You're, you're game over. You know, so I train something. If I get tired, I take a break or I say, okay, that's enough for now. And then I'll come back to it. People go, really? I go, yeah, I'll train throughout the day. I don't just train for an hour. No, I mean, you know, train for 30 minutes. It's Florida, man. I'm soaking wet. Okay. You know, I'm outside. You know, let's take a little break and then, you know, get back to it or maybe do it tonight or maybe do it tomorrow. Why? Dude, you don't have to finish now. Why, why do we have this manic obsession with it's going to get done now? It's like, okay, just continue. You know, in other words, oh, okay, stop now, recover, listen to your body, go eat some food. You can't recover without eating. I don't, you know, I mean, yeah, you can fast and all that, but eventually you got to eat good food. You're going to, Recovery is also diet. You know, trust me, you and I both are big guys. I, I, I've i lost 150 pounds over the last three years, man. I got huge. I was over 400 pounds. I'm about 320 right now. You know, I was 100, 100, I was like four, almost 460. It was crazy. I could put a beer, you know, I could put a beer in my belly. It would stand up. That's no good. You know, why? I was going through divorce, you know, crazy stuff. And I was just, I was eating my emotions. I figured it out. Okay. I stopped eating the things that are wrong with me. You know, hey, look good, feel good. Same with training. You should feel good. I don't care about the looking good, but you should look the way you should look depending on your system. You know, I always love, I always love Savat, how they, you know, they're, they're very, I don't know, man, boom, boom, boom. Just, I don't see a lot of excessive swinging and, you know. They're it, very it, calm. They're very just, calm. You, you know, back, this was, I'm going to tell you this, this was back in 91. We did a, uh, the doctors came in and we were, we we're part of INSEP, part of the French team. And nice. they came in and they were doing, they were doing some tests of blood pressure. Okay. Heartbeats. And they took, uh, one, one, one of, uh, a dear, a dear brother of mine, who was a world champion, Francois Pinacchio. And he, you can look up his, his, uh, fight. He fought, uh, Ramon Drecker, which was survived against Tybox, really. Wow. And he beat him. But, uh, Ooh. anyway, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, for those folks in there, remember, Francois Pinocchio with Dreco, you can, you can look it up on YouTube. Well, anyway, his blood pressure before he started right. sparring was one was a number, okay? I don't remember the number. It was one number. We did 20 rounds in the ring. At the 10th round, which is a peak of the, the, the highest, or the, at the middle of the round, right. his, it was the same number. It didn't change. At the end of the 20, he was the same. He was calm throughout the whole thing. And he did on everybody else. And everybody's numbers would fluctuate maybe five degrees off. Right. But it was never. Because Savat teaches you to be calm and breathe and move all that while you're moving it. And while you're moving and be so calm. You and just, you just, you just gave out a secret, dude. You just, gave, you just gave out a secret. Breathing. People think breathing is some mundane, simple bull. I go, no, 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 no. The more oxygen... The, the higher your oxygen level in your body, the higher optimal levels you're working at. And the lower your oxygen levels in your body, you, you, you're, you're, you're hallucinating. What, you're, not, you're not doing what you think you're doing. You're hallucinating because <laughs> you have lack of oxygen in your head. You, know, you think you're doing good, and then your teacher comes over and goes, you need a break. Why? Yeah, you need to. Yep, you have to right now, you know, and that's, that, that's funny. That's funny. So again, and, uh, it's true. It, it is the truth. You have to. That's why they tell a lot of folks, you know, in boxing and in, in, in the pugilistic arts, you need to go do some running. Go do, go do your, but you have to do it by yourself. You know, I some people running. don't. Jump I jump rope. rope. I'd rather jump rope. I hate running because it makes me think of getting chased. You know, I, get, I used to get chased as a kid, you know, so I'm like, man, I'd rather just, you know, or I just do a lot of, you know, like we were talking earlier before for anybody who's, you know, who, who's joining us later is that maze training. I do 
high rep maces or I, I'll, I'll do, you know, I'll do a clean and snatch with a kettlebell or I'll do lots of swings. I'll do things and just run the reps up with a light weight to just get that, you know, aerobic conditioning kind of go, why? I hate running. Absolutely. You know, I mean, jumping rope. I, I'm pretty fast as a fat guy, but that's because I'm running away from you or, you know, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want to do that unless I have to, you know. You know, now, of course. I, you know we, we do a lot of hunting at the ranch and uh, people always come out, the hunters come out and goes, man, did you see that hog run? That was a 300 pounder. They run pretty damn fast. They run 45 miles an hour like this in the brush. Yeah, I know. They don't, it, you know it, 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 no. You see these animals on a, on a 50, a 50 degree incline hill, you know, like the, the goats behind you. And you see these things go boop, boop, boop. And it would take us three hours to, to do the same thing. And they're just like, dip, dip, two seconds. And you're like, holy crap. I am such a weak little unfurred, you know, little animal compared to those guys. You know, holy crap. <laughs> You know, grizzly Absolutely. bears. Well, what's what's the speed of a grizzly bear at full run? Yeah, I don't want. I don't want. You're not going to outrun a bear. You're going to. No, you know, you're not going to outrun a bear. You're not going to outrun a boar. You're not going to outrun an elephant. It ain't, it's not going to happen. You know, yeah. so elephants run 35 miles an hour. 30. Okay, and how much do they weigh? It's math, dude. It's physics. You're going to get squished because that that thousand, a few thousand pounds of meat is coming at you. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's like a super duper heavyweight. I'm going to get I mean, out of the they way. They can't run for a mile, but I'll tell you one thing. There's no tree in Africa that you're going to climb that he's not going to bring it down. Oh, dude. And people forget that pumas and cougars and other, other big cats can climb trees really well. You know, you know, <laughs> and that, you know I, tell, I tell folks that they go, oh, they killed the poor elephant. Really? I mean, I'm not into the big game. I've, I've been no, to elephant no. homes. I've seen them. I've been there. I back people up, but I'm not in, into that. You know, number one, I'm, I don't have the money to spend for, for 40, 40, 40 K, 50 K to, to shoot an elephant in, you know, more power to you if you can do that, you know, but uh, um, that's the way I look at it. If, if somebody, so when I, I know what the dangers of it, I know what can happen to it. I know that even a wounded elephant is going to bring you down. It's going to take everybody around. That's I can only yeah. imagine. I can only imagine a smaller, yeah. more maneuverable animal. Like you, 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 you wound a boar, or you know, you wound you wound a mother bear, and their cubs are. In, oh, dude! I mean, there's things in nature you got to watch out for. Absolutely, they'll take you out. And people they're, they're, are they, they're they're the apex. Yeah. yeah, but we're the same way. I mean, we we need what we're doing. As I tell anybody, I tell people, if you're learning to defend yourself, you, you, it's a mindset. You got to learn where are you, what are you doing. And where are you going? It's the three questions just based on, it's a little different. In other words, know what you're doing. Look at, look out where the hell you are. And if you're getting into a car, get the keys out and, you know, and, and ahead of under the lights, you know, that kind of thing. It's funny how people, oh, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want at whatever time and I'm safe. Um, that's not true. And anybody saying that is, is, is being, you know, is being a bad person is not truth. Is being, you know, they're, they're being very untrue. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, and that's what people do not, you know, you know, people do not want to understand or don't want to give their time in. They in martial so. arts, all, all systems are good. They're all right. systems were de were de devised to defend yourself at one point or another. Right. Other other systems better than others, of course, there is because mankind is just that way. Some systems were were built to destroy the other system. It's just the way right. mankind is, and Human one has to understand Human that, and one has right. to, as a student. And as a teacher, realize that that is. That's why a lot of grandmasters or and I hate to use the term grandmasters. I'm going to say seafoods and professors. Um, the reasons a lot of seafoods and professors cross train is because they want to be able to have an edge for them, their own personal safety. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, uh, and you have to realize that at certain times in certain villages in certain cities, you might have had two schools. Right. OK, you might have had and their students kept on with the same two schools and it was very much taboo for you to go train with the other school. I know it was it wouldn't, it wouldn't allow you to. But I guarantee you that the senior students of those two schools became friends along the way and would cross train on on their own. So we got that's how we get over that, dude. It's like we did it outside quite. Hey, come over to my house and, you know, shh. We were like, hey, show me, show me your first form. I'll show you mine. And then, hey, what's it for? Hey, I'll show you what this is for. And so we started exchanging, you know, 
and I've been doing this ever since I started training and people are like, how dare you? How dare I? I'm no offense, but my martial arts is mine. Nobody can take it away from me unless you kill me or paralyze me. So a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. They can take my rank away. They can throw me out of their association, but I still have whatever I learned from them in me. Again, unless you, you know, take my Kung Fu and people don't, some people go, what do you mean? Taking somebody's Kung Fu means you kill them or you paralyze them so they don't move anymore. Then they, we, we see, we made a joke. You talked about, you don't like to say grandmaster. Well, I don't like to say the word master. I was taught masters are dead because they can't train anymore. They have mastered their craft because they, they no longer can practice. So to me, a master is dead. If you're alive, you're not a master, you're a teacher. And I could call you the head teacher, the head, you know, the head instructional, whatever, but I don't, that M word, you know, you know, I, 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 look at, I look, I look at it like this, you know, I see, I see that. And I look at master, the, the actual term of what master means. Right. And there's only two, two creatures that can, or there's two beings that can, they call somebody a master. One is a dog as a master and the other one's a slave. And I don't, I, I don't own any slaves, and I'm not a slave to anybody, so I'm not calling anybody master. Now, there's systems that all of a sudden you have master at this rank and grandmaster at this rank. I don't, I don't like that as per se. Yeah. They're taking, they're taking a word that was either in French or in Italian or in Spanish, and they're anglicizing it. You know, and in the terminology meaning as, as I've mastered a style or I mastered a thing. So he's mastered that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's a master. It just means that he has, has skill gotten level. skill level wise, you know, and, um, and many people, you know, that have those terms really can't demonstrate it anymore. It's funny, you know, people say, well, who do you think is really good? And I tell them, and they go, I don't know who that is. And I go, I know. And they go, well, what about so-and-so, a very public person? I, and I just shake my head and go, no offense, but they're, they're, they're okay. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, look, you really want me? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but that person isn't as skilled as they think they are. Hmm. You know, they're good at this. They're not good at that. And I don't care about this. I care about that. So... And you, I want and a you, talker. I want a doer. I want to do, not talk. Can, if the person can teach you, you know, but again, here's where we come back. The arts have always been the same. A lot of people say, right. oh, back then the martial arts were different because people paid less and that and so on and so forth. Really? In the 70s, 50 bucks might have been very expensive. 30 bucks for an income was a lot of money per month. Right. The equivalents it hasn't really changed. Most martial arts schools now are anywhere between 150 to 300 bucks a month. Right. And that's in any city. If you go to some of the other ones, they're charging an exorbitant amount, you know, they can even be charging 350 for whatever. And you're like, and um, I have one guy come in and he says, Oh, well, I go oh, down the street. I pay 200 bucks a month. You're charging 150. That means the other school down there is doing better. It's a lot better because of the charge of price. And I go, how many times have you been with the, with the instructor? Because I, I, I kind of know the prices around, right? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, no, that's just for me to roll around in the ground. But if I really want to take a class with the instructor, I have to pay another $75 per class with the instructor. So you're paying 200 just to go over there and just roll around with people that aren't <laughs> – you know you what I'm saying? With, I'm just like, come learn with me. You're actually touching my hands. I'm actually putting my hands on yeah, your I'm body. Gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm like, really? Okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, it just depends, you know? <laughs> People are always like, why don't you charge more money? I'm like, you know, I don't have a school. I don't have a, I teach out of my house or at their, you know, wherever I, my good friend, Russ Smith in Dade City, I train with him. You know, sometimes, you know, I ask, hey, can I, can I bring some people over and have a little training set? Why? He's got a nice school. You know, and people go, why don't you have a school? I'm like, do you know how much that costs, the overhead? I, I don't have that kind of money. And if I did, I'd have four or 500, you know, kids paying the bills. And that's my friends who have the crazy kid programs. They're the ones who survive. Why? Because they went from 500 kids to 200 kids. They still survive because 200 kids paying, like you said, how much a month? That's a lot of money coming in. But they also do after school programs. You know, it's not just 
you know, they're, they're heavily involved in the kids' lives to help them out, you know, so always a good thing. Way, and, and, and like I said, and I tell people, in a way, that's good. Why? Because you're, you're giving that child an opportunity. You're giving them self-confidence. You're giving them a little bit of self-pride. A lot of those times are things that, that help out a person at peer, when peer pressure is at, at its best. Does it mean he taught him how to fight? Probably not, but at least that person's not going to be pushed into, you know, hey, let's smoke this after class. You know what I'm saying? Kind of thing. Again, it kept, you know, I started when I was a kid, it kept me off the street. And we trained in what we call the police boys club, the Hanover police boys club. The police started an old, they took an old DPW garage. They bought like a thousand pounds of weights, machines. They got a boxing ring and we had a, you know, like an open area where the karate dojo was. And dude, I was 11 years old and I'm like, I got a, I got a karate school a mile away from my house. Are you kidding me? This is, I was like my dream come true. You know, I can be there every, I can be there every day. The worst thing, I went to Karate Kid with my old man. He took me to see the movie. And we're watching, you know, him do all the housework. He looks at me, he goes, hey, you can do all the housework for me. And it's training. I'm like, oh, shit. Right. Worst thing in the world. The old man, he's like, paint the fence, kid. Paint the fence. Oh, man. But it was good. Why? Because doing all that stuff helped me, strengthened me, gave me a skill in something. Like painting the fence, dude, I've learned how to do soft brush blocks for years. I worked as a bouncer. I can't be killing people, you know, but this person's trying to kill me. I got to softly get them off me, grab them, put them into a hole and take them outside and let the cops deal with them. You know? So all that weird karate kid shit. Yeah. Hey, guess what? That actually gave me a, a physical attribute that was applicable, you know, to my training. So don't laugh at it. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't crap. They're giving you the secrets right there. If you train it with all these ranges of motion with something, you're strengthening that range of motion. Absolutely. You're absolutely, absolutely. I mean, how do you get stronger punching? Like by yeah. doing something that, you know, trains what? That trains, you know, I always say punching his elbows. What? Because, you know, how do you drive your hand forward? Well, you got to drive your, your arm forward. How does it drive forward? It drives forward with your elbow. You know, scapulars in there a little bit too, but it's, it's my elbow that, you know, goes back and forward. Absolutely. You know, um, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to plug a little bit in here. Folks, if you guys need some, some jowl for training, the best one comes from doctor here. So order and, and again, again how can, I, how I make can, a guarantee. How can they get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me. You know, you can come dalegas.com. I'm online. I'm on Facebook, you know, Dale Dugas AP. You know, you can give me a call at 813-285-1895. That is my cell phone. If I don't pick up, leave me a message. You can email me at herbs at dalegas.com. That's H E. H E R B S at dildubis.com. I guarantee that any kit from me will make double what you order. Nobody else does this. Beware of herbal suppliers. There are a lot of people out there who will take your money and give you a sandwich bag full of herbs. It's, it's unacceptable. It's disgusting. These people are ripping you off. Be very, very cautious about anybody that charges hundreds of dollars for you buy something, you buy a gallon or two gallon or three gallon kit for me, you're going to get four or five pounds of herbs to make this kit. You know, I always give more. Why? Because there's so many not so good people that are, that are giving you a little bit for a crazy amount of money. I've learned how to make the strongest herbs, how to process them to make them work the, the most optimal ever. Anybody can tell you, you get a kit for me, you put it in the container, you throw the alcohol in, within 24 hours, it's black. Other people, it takes months. Mine, within 24 hours, are guaranteed to get dark. Why? I know how to do this. I learned a lot from old people, old martial art people that people forgot about. You know, And I was the one who went, you know, I don't want to do the line dancing. I'm a typical white guy. I don't dance. So I got to help, I got to help the herbalists in the Kung Fu school watching, learning. Hey, I'm watching these guys do Trina and doing, we had, a, we had somebody that would take green onion and ginger, rice wine cook it up into a mash, he'd throw it into a big cheesecloth bag, and he would use this as a poultice to warm up the body. Then he would take his hands and he'd do his tweena. He'd reach in and do his manipulative therapy to fix people. They'd scream. Why? Because this, this little old Chinese man had hands bigger than mine. His hands were about a good two inches bigger. On, he had bare hands. He'd reach in and grab you and fix you. And you know, then he would either give you pills to take or he would give you liniment to put on, depending on the issue. So when we're talking herbs, guys, 
for, don't forget, I have internal herbs if you have, you know, more serious issues. I have access to hundreds of formulas, not just for recovery, but for other aspects of health, you know, allergies, things like that, the flu. I've got a great flu recovery formula. So if you're sick, let me know. I'm here to help you. Absolutely. And especially now with, uh, with everything going on with, Again, with the with, on flu. you know, basically, you know, disease doesn't exist. The only thing that exists now is COVID. It's kind of funny. Like science supposedly changed in the last few years. Like it, it's a, it's a like a crap is what it is. Now I'm not saying that it doesn't exist or people aren't dying from it. I'm saying the fear mongering about it is disgusting. You know, Absolutely. there are people, there are people, and what these people are having is these are people that have COVID morbidities. They have a serious problem with their health. They're not, they're not dying from the COVID. The COVID is affecting their COVID mobility and masturbating the problem. So if you have a bad heart, it makes your heart not work well, or your kidneys not work well, or your lungs not work well. I feel horrible for these people. But the politicizing and the, and the shaming of, you know, if you, you know, they're pushing an agenda that I don't, I'm not appreciative of. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, I, feel you know the same way. I feel the same way. Yeah, I, I, I don't shame people. people. It's like, I'm not going to harm you because you don't do something. And I don't care what your, your reasoning for it is. If you choose a stance... I respect you as a human being. That's your stance. I'm not going to shame you or harm you because of that. But that's what's happening. You know, it's further, they're trying to divide us into, you know, the, the further they divide us means we can't control these people. And people go, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I go, we're their boss. I'm not their employee. They're, I'm their employer. And these people have forgotten about that, you know? And I mean, dude. You know, governor, governor, you know, we're getting a little political, but uh, the governor in California there, I think it's going to get recalled really quick, you know, because he hasn't been helping anybody. He's been harming people left and right with what he's been doing. And, and that's what I said. And I'm going to uh, jump into politics real quick. And I yeah. said this last year, those incumbents that are going to be up for re-election, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. Here in Laredo, we saw it. You know, we started seeing it. So it just depends. And uh, this is what I want. Yeah, I try not to piss anybody off. Again, you know, <laughs> why do that? Why? If you keep getting people upset, eventually they're going to do something. And they're, they, you know, and again, it might not be nice. It might be physical or it might be, hey, they're going to try to, you know, they're going to stalk you. Why are you pissing people off? If people think it's funny to piss people off, I go, do you understand that they might get physical and you're not able to defend yourself? But wait a minute, you want to defund the police, but then you're yelling at the police to protect it because you're opening your big mouth and somebody beat you up for it. Um, maybe you should watch your mouth because there's people out there who are going to beat you up over it or worse than beat you up. They're going to remove you from the food chain because of whatever the hell you said or did. And people go, I, I don't understand. Like, well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So you either have the police to protect you or you protect yourself. Yeah, I, I have no ill will. I have no ill will towards people. You know, I agree with you 100. I'm a mirror. I'm here to help you. But if you throw it at me, hey, dude, don't take it. Don't take offense to it. But I'm going to throw it back at you. And I'm a lot better at it than most people. You know, you know you're not going to harm me. Forget. That's you're what you see. That's what people forget. People forget about all that stuff. And yeah. uh, and but I see I see the fear mongering coming in, and it's affected a lot of martial arts schools. And I feel for a lot of my our 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 colleagues out there that have martial arts schools that they're not coming back. They're not reopening back. No. There's schools that were icons in certain areas and people knew that these teachers were there teaching. Those schools aren't coming back anymore. They're gone. They're gone. Everybody, everybody thinks that, Oh, we're just, everything's going to reopen again. It's, everything's going to be flowers and candy. I'm like, you're deluded. You're, you're, what are you smoking? Why? I want some of it. Cause you know, I'm a medical marijuana patient. I'm like, I want some of what you're smoking. Cause I don't, I'm not getting that. <laughs> give me, give me, give me. And people laugh and they go, you're kidding. I go, no, these people are, they're on some kind of drug because it's not reality. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And martial oh, arts, and, and I'm going to go back into martial arts. And, uh, to, oh, yeah. It comes back into the martial arts. Totally. You know, ma martial arts is here to make people more confident, make people stand up for themselves, and people to defend themselves. Right. And a lot of martial artists should be still practicing, especially in this time now, because a lot of people are not only going into depression, they're being feared into a corner, right? They're crying in the corner. They're afraid to shake people's hands or even smile at them anymore. It's, it is ridiculous. It is. Listen, I, I, I am the friendliest person out in reality. I talked to anybody like years ago, I'm up in New York before, you know, I, I wrote a book on iron pump. So if you're interested, you know, look up 
look up me on Amazon, you know, look up, you know, fundamental iron skills. You can also buy the book for me anyway. But I was up in New York and I'm on the train with my editor. We're going somewhere. And I bumped into this gangbanger and, you know, big, huge guy made me look like a kid. And I go, Oh dude, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to bump into you. And I start talking to him. I'm like, Hey dude, I love, I love those shoes. We start talking. Well, we get off the train and my buddy goes, why the hell were you talking to that guy? Dude, he's a gangbanger. And I'm like, I'm not afraid to talk to anybody, bro. You know, I didn't treat him like a, I didn't treat him like a why did I treat him like a gangbanger? I'm gonna treat him like a human being. He's sitting next to me and he's a big dude. I'm like, hey dude, I love your kicks. You know, and he fist bumped me. Hey, I just made a new friend. Yeah. But people tell me, oh, I can't talk to him because he's black and black people are bad. I'm like, dude, I'm from Boston. I I get this cracker shit down here in the south all the time. I'm in Florida. I'm not a cracker, man. I, you know. I'm not, you know, I'm not the KKK. I'm not, I'm not a racist whatsoever. I do not care about your skin color. It's what you say and what you do that, that affect me. Absolutely. Not like. I don't care what you look like. It's, <laughs> well, you know, again, what comes out of your cake hole, you know, and what do you do with your body? That's what I'm worried about more. Absolutely. You know? And this is I'm a new martial art thing. So when we get back to martial arts, okay. Like, I love my Kempo friends, but some of my Kempo friends I have some problems with because they think they're going to do all these crazy strikes with their hands and their fingers and, and they do no conditioning. And my you buddy, condition. you my touch buddy, something right now. You have to condition your hands. Because I'm telling you, if you put somebody in the face and the person ducks and you hit his <laughs> cranium, I guarantee you, you're going to break your fingers. You're going to snap them. You're going to crack gonna them. How many times have I seen people, students, miss, they miss or they miss a block and they punch somebody in the head and it drives their carpals up over their, you know, up over their wrist and they're screaming, you know, and it looks pretty bad. It's, a, you know, it swells up like, hell. No. it's a, we call it, you know, it's a boxer's fracture. You've basically, you, you've caused a, an injury here at the connection that have, you shifted the, the, the bones of your hand up over the wrist bone. Very common, you know? Now I've done it, but not, but I did it because I hit the wall. I was punching a Maki bar and somebody goes, Hey Dale. And I went, what? And I, you know, punched the wall and I broke, you know, oops. Listen, uh, I've had, I've had them, I've had them busted. I've had teeth inside them, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> I got some scars. You can't really <laughs> so, see them, but. So, so you, you know, you come out and it starts swelling and then all of a sudden you put comes out and all of a sudden some little white little piece of enamel comes out, you know? Right? Oh, okay. But that, that occurs, that occurs. But you have to condition your hands. Condition your hand. If you think you're going to punch somebody with an unconditioned hand and harm them, no, no, you're going to break your hand. I'm going to poke you in the. I'm going to poke you in the throat. Really? No. You're, what you're going to do is your, your fingers are going to crumple. You're going to break them. And the guy, how, I've seen people just crunch down and break people's fingers. Why? Because they don't have any strength. Let me tell you. Let me. And you touched a good point. A lot of folks say in boxing. I go. Why do you think? you wear gloves and why do you think they wrap it's not to protect the other person it's to protect your hands i hit you know i used to hit in a gym i'd hit a heavy bag with no gloves on the guys like aren't you afraid to hurt your hands I'm like no bro don't worry about it you know and i'm like boom and i'm you know this bag's going up you know it's going horizontal i'm hitting it. And they're like damn dude i'm like what i don't i don't need to wrap my hands i've never wrapped my hands i don't want to wrap my hands i i, I don't like the feel it it makes me have a weird dude I need my wrist unencumbered so I can, you know, basically whatever I need to do and realign it when I'm hitting you, I need to do that. If I have a huge thing on it that holds my hands st stiff, it's not really going to work. Now, of course, again, I understand why you're doing it in a competition. You're trying not to harm yourself. Yeah. You know? But for me, I don't need it. Absolutely. But, you know, brother, it was a great conversation and right? we have to continue moving forward. Hopefully we can, I'll this do, we'll, we'll look, this is, we haven't, we haven't even touched on the stuff, but basically, you know, using different things like jowls for conditioning, we can also get into the conditioning programs themselves and like, Hey, what do systems use? What are, you know, what do you think is a good, you know, we can actually critique them. Why we have the eyes to look at material and go, Hey, that's really good. And we also can say, I don't think that's really healthy to do. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking at something and making an assessment going, I don't think I want to do that. I think that's going to hurt me in the long run, you know? So yeah, I look forward to you know more interactions so we can we can get this information out to people and help them train better, recover better, have less health issues, and have better, you know, better health, longevity, and power up into their old age. Absolutely. Folks, if you like this session, click like, share, and I'm gonna leave you with this. If you're out there training, 
and you're training wrong, it's nobody's fault but yours for paying, not paying attention. And if somebody's telling you to do something that's going to get you hurt, skedaddle out of that school that, that fast, okay? If you guys want to get some herbs from the doctor, please, uh, we'll put it on, on the bottom of, uh, of the information here on YouTube. You guys can look at it at the bottom. Until next time, much peace. Brother, you take care. Thank you. Peace.